Welcome everybody to the 13th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series and the 20th year of the Citrus Organization. I'm Brandi Nonicki, the director of the Citrus Policy Lab. I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, Brian Christian. Brian is the author of the acclaimed bestsellers, The Most Human Human and Algorithms to Live By with Tom Griffiths, which have been translated into 19 languages. His work has won several awards, including fellowships at Yaddo and the McDowell Colony, publication in Best American Science and Nature Writing, and an award from the Academy of American Poets. A visiting scholar at the Citrus Policy Lab, the scientific communicator in residence at the Simons Institute, and an affiliate of the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence. It is my great honor to welcome Brian Christian. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brandy, for uh, the opportunity to speak uh, with the Citrus uh, community. And it's a particular honor for me because Citrus has been um, my academic community during the, the last several years in which I've been researching and, and writing this book. So it, uh, it means a lot to be able to, um, uh, to speak uh, with, with the Citrus community. And so I want to express, uh, first of all, my, my appreciation and thanks to, uh, to Brandy Nanaki herself and to Camille Crittenden, um, who have made me feel so at home at Citrus. Um, so the story that I want to talk about um, this afternoon is that I really feel that we have reached a kind of crossroads with respect to machine learning technology. Um, and that crossroads, I think, is the result of two intersecting trends that we now find ourselves um, at. And so the first of these trends is the incredible leap forward that we have seen in the progress of machine learning technology itself. And there are many, many examples I could point to here, whether it's AlphaGo or self-driving cars. I mean, we, I, I think we're familiar with this idea, but to pick one, um, this is the ImageNet competition. Um, and it shows, I think this is a perfect illustration of two things. One is the incredible sort of discontinuous step function that happened between 2011 and 2012, which marks the really the beginning of the deep learning revolution. And the other is this broader trend. If you look from 2010 to 2017, this remarkable 90% um, drop in error rates on this particular task. Um, and in fact, we are now at a point where image recognition technology and deep learning has gotten so good that you can't even take a photograph with a modern smartphone camera without invoking this, you know, 12 step deep uh, machine learning pipeline that's calculating the exposure, the white balance, the focus, the highlighting, uh, fusing together different um, captures of the same shot, um, et cetera, et cetera, all based on what the camera thinks it is seeing and what the camera thinks that what it's seeing should look like. Um, of course, this makes us um, particularly sensitive to the question of, is the camera really seeing what it thinks it's seeing? Um, so the second trend I think is maybe less celebrated than the kind of sudden leap forward in, uh, in machine learning uh, capability, but is, is just as significant, which is the penetration of machine learning models into the decision-making infrastructure of society itself. So this chart um, shows the rise in the number of US states that are using statistical or algorithmic parole prediction instruments, uh, risk assessment scores to determine parole. And uh, this chart only goes through 2004, but you can imagine what the last two decades have looked like. And we're now at a point where, uh, for instance, when the US Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts recently visited Rensselaer, um, the university president, Shirley Ann Jackson, asked him, can you foresee a day when artificial intelligence will assist with courtroom fact-finding or even more controversially with judicial decision-making? Um, and he responded, yes, uh, that day is already here. And so, I think we really find ourselves in this remarkable moment where these two trends have collided. Uh, the things that machine learning systems can do are leaping forward. Meanwhile, they are steadily percolating through the actual um, 
social apparatus that we have for making um, very consequential decisions, um, not just in criminal justice, but in medicine, in finance, in lending, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on all of these counts, we've started to see in the last five years or so, people becoming increasingly and I think appropriately concerned um, that these models may, may not be doing what we uh, intend for them to be doing. And that concern, uh, while I think it has become uh, particularly acute as of late, is by no means new to the field. In fact, it goes um, all the way back to the mid 20th century, uh, where the MIT cyberneticist Norbert Wiener um, famously writes in this essay called uh, Some Moral and Technical Consequences of Automation. Um, he paints the following picture. He says, we, we all know the fable of the sorcerer's apprentice. Um, some of us may know it as a Goethe poem. More of us probably know it as the uh, Disney Fantasia animated short with Mickey Mouse as the Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, where he animates the broom to fill up the cauldron, but he maybe doesn't quite have his uh, magic uh, fully mastered. And so the, the broom carries out his instructions all too well and ends up overflowing the cauldron and nearly drowning him until the, uh, the master magician appears and is able to stop it. Now, Wiener is writing in 1960, you know, disastrous results like this are to be expected not merely in the world of fairy tales, but in the real world. Um, and the famous passage begins, if we use to achieve our purposes, a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot efficiently interfere once we've started it, then we had better be quite sure that the purpose we put into the machine is that which we really desire and not merely a colorful imitation of it. So these days, uh, we know this problem by the name of the alignment problem, uh, which is the question of whether the machine's um, incentives, its goals, its behavior um, aligns with us. Is it learning what we really think it's learning? Is it generalizing the way we hope it's generalizing? And is it going to behave the way that we um, expected or, or wanted it to behave? Um, I think for many people in the you know, public at large, there is a sense that people both within the field of computer science, as well as outside policymakers, et cetera, are kind of pulling the fire alarm, so to speak, and saying, you know, there are, there are genuine issues here, both at present and kind of waiting, waiting for us in the near future. Um, but for me, there's a story that begins here that I think hasn't been fully told and hasn't been fully appreciated um, in the public, which is this incredible response that we have been seeing even over the last um, just four to five years, an uh, explosion of activity in terms of nonprofit groups, um, research centers, um, grants. There's a first generation of PhD students that's um, now graduating that has matriculated explicitly uh, to work on these questions of ethics and safety and machine learning. Um, and not only do we have a real scientific agenda at this point, but the agenda is underway. And we, we, we can notch some, I think, significant success stories um, really just in the last few years. And so that was the story that I set out to tell. Um, and that has been the focus of my research and my work over the last four and a half years. And so um, the book really represents my work to try to delve as deeply into the history of some of these questions as I could, um, as well as to speak with as many people as I could on the front lines, so to speak, of the alignment problem. And the book ends up featuring approximately 100 interviews uh, with people across the field. Um, so uh, for better or worse, this afternoon, it's just me. I don't have uh, 100 um, colleagues alongside me. Um, and we only have enough time to kind of really scratch the surface, but I want to share with you um, at least a sampling of what I think are some of the most significant um, causes both for concern and for feeling a little bit of encouragement at the progress that we've been able to make in a remarkably short period of time. So thinking about the alignment problem, does this machine learning system train on examples, really learn what we think it's learning, and will it do what we want it to do? For me, that breaks down very broadly speaking into two questions. Um, what are the actual examples on which the system is trained? What is the training data? Um, and secondly, what is the objective function? What is the numerical um, expression of what we want the system to actually do? And so 
Um, we'll look at each of these areas in turn, highlighting both the cautionary tales as well as the um, increasingly interdisciplinary progress that's actually being made. So first, the training data. Uh, now, this section of the book begins with what is sadly one of the most iconic failures of um, image recognition software in the last several years, which I think will be familiar to many people in the audience, which is the story of uh, software developer Jackie Alcine, who um, gets a notification that his Google Photos um, has been updated. They're now using deep convolutional networks to automatically group and caption uh, your photographs. It sounds um, intriguing, so he checks it out. And to his horror, he finds that Google Photos has automatically created an album of selfies of himself and his friend and has given it the caption, Gorillas. So this is, um, again, the, one of these kind of flagship failures, um, but it has really spurred a, um, a reckoning and a, a real um, explosion of research work into this area. Some of the people who have led, I think the most foundational work are Joy Bolomwini from MIT Media Lab and Timni Gebru of Google Brain and um, Microsoft Research. And they have shown, for example, that e even with um, you know, contemporary commercial face recognition, face classification software, um, the error rates can differ um, between race and gender in a factor of, in some cases, tenfold. Um, and this has caused, I think, a, uh, a needed uh, reckoning for, for commercial software. Um, it's also something that we're seeing in the academic world in terms of a much greater scrutiny put onto what actually goes into data sets. Uh, I'm thinking of the labeled faces in the wild data set, uh, which was collected by scraping newspaper images from the late 2000s. Um, and a subsequent analysis, uh, many years after this data set was released, has shown that you know, it has exactly the biases that you might expect in terms of what types of people were shown on newspaper articles uh, from the late 2000s. Uh, in particular, it's 77% male, 83% white. Uh, the number one most prevalent individual in the data set it was then US President George W. Bush. Um, in fact, there are more than twice as many pictures of George W. Bush as there are of all black women combined. I think this has really created a bit of a sea change in the way that we as academics talk about these data sets and think about um, what goes into their collection and, and how we want people to um, receive them or to use them. Um, so for me, it's very interesting. If you look at the original paper um, that came out in 2007 with this data set, it says, this data set clearly has its own biases. For example, there are not many images with bad lighting uh, because we use uh, this particular filter. There are a limited number of faces from the side or from above or below. However, the range and diversity of pictures present is very large. Fast forward to 2019, the same data set now appears uh, with this giant red warning label that says, hold on, uh, you know, depending on what you want to use this for, you know, we just want to state up front, many groups are not well represented in this data set. There are very few children, there are no babies, very few people over 80, a very small percentage of women and many ethnic groups have small representation or none. And I, I, I don't say this to pick on uh, labeled faces in the wild, but to indicate, I think, this broader shift in, the, uh, in academia itself, which is that uh, 13, 14 years ago, when we said bias or diversity, uh, we were talking about lighting and pose. And now those terms um, have this very kind of social and demographic meaning. So the, the things that we're thinking about as being relevant when we build these data sets has changed in, I think, a very dramatic way. Um, this is also um, something that comes up not only in the kind of present day um, ethics and these sorts of representational harms, um, it's also a question that comes up in robotics safety and, for example, self-driving cars. So this is Andre Karpathy, the head of AI at Tesla, and I'm stealing a slide from one of his presentations, but um, to, to illustrate this point, when he was a graduate student, he, re he reports to us, uh, he lost 95% of his sleep 
over models and algorithms. But now as head of AI at Tesla, he loses 75% of his sleep about data sets and what they contain and what is perhaps missing. And um, sadly, I think this lost sleep is very well-founded because we've seen, for example, um, fatal accidents involving self-driving cars. This was the Uber that killed the pedestrian in Tempe, Arizona in 2018. And reading the National Transportation Safety Board uh, review uh, that came out about a year after the accident, um, one of the contributing causes to the accident was that the training data appears not to have included uh, images of jaywalkers. So all of the pedestrians on which the model uh, was trained had them crossing at crosswalks or at intersections or at stop signs. And so when the system encountered a pedestrian in a different situation, um, all bets were off and it was not at all clear that it was going to make the recognition. Um, so fortunately, there's a lot of work being done, both in terms of scrutinizing how these data sets are assembled, but also in diagnosing what a model might have learned, even if all you have access to is the trained model after the fact, and you don't even have access to the data set, maybe you don't even know what the data set contained, there are still some diagnostic tools here that we can use as a kind of sanity check. So Chris Ola at um, Google Brain and OpenAI has done, I think, some superb work in this area. Um, he's uh, developed a method that basically allows you to create a kind of um, super stimulus. Um, you can start with an image of some colorful static and have the model uh, essentially fine tune the pixels in the image until it maximizes a particular categorization. And in so doing, you can essentially get the model to output um, these hallucinogenic uh, images of what that category um, really uh, resembles in terms of its internal activation. Now, most of the time, this produces pretty normal, slightly surreal, but you know, plausible looking things, anemone fish, banana, parachutes, screw, that seems fine. But it can also help you identify places where the model might have generalized incorrectly, or there might be some problem in the training data. So for example, um, this is what he found for the category of dumbbell. And you can see that the dumbbells come uh, with these flexing muscular arms kind of pre-attached, uh, just dangling into midair, which um, in addition to being this kind of Salvador Dali-esque um, image, suggests to us something from a safety perspective, which is that uh, the model may not safely generalize to dumbbells that are sitting on the ground or dumbbells that are in a rack. And so that's the kind of thing um, that indicates a, an issue with the training data, but we can catch it um, after the training process, but before deployment. So I think that's a very, techniques like that have a, a huge role to play. And some of these issues I think can be quite subtle. Um, so this is Bean Kim at Google Brain who has developed um, a method called testing with concept activation vectors or TCAV, um, which uses the internal activations of the model uh, to show how certain kind of high level human concepts end up playing a role in the model's ultimate categorization. So if we see, for example, stripes, horse, and savanna end up being relevant to the models uh, categorizing something as a zebra, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, if we look at a doctor, we see white coat, we see stethoscope, but we also see the concept of uh, male. And so that indicates that there might be something weird about what's going on with the training data, or there might be some bias in the, in the model. And this can be extremely subtle. Um, for example, uh, her work on Google's inception model showed that the color red was intrinsic to the model's categorization of fire trucks. Well, this seems reasonably intuitive. I think to an American, fire trucks basically are red. Um, in the UK, they're generally red as well, but not in Australia, where fire trucks are often white and or neon yellow. Um, so this suggests, for example, that a uh, self-driving car that made use of this model uh, might be safer in the US but might not be safe to deploy uh, down under. Now, this is an issue, again, that cuts across the kind of present day fairness and bias community, as well as the sort of longer term technical AGI safety community. So this is Dario Amade, who leads the safety team at OpenAI. 
Um, and he is one of the authors of a seminal paper called Concrete Problems in AI Safety. One of the problems that they highlight is what they call robustness to distributional change or distributional shift. And this is, again, this idea that you train a model on a certain um, distribution, uh, then for whatever combination of reasons, uh, it finds itself, perhaps as a result of its own actions, it finds itself in an environment that doesn't resemble what it was trained on. So ideally, you would want a system which had some ability to recognize itself that it was in an area where it was uncomfortable. It didn't have a lot of um, you know, comparable training data to draw from. So you might imagine this as a kind of backstop, for example, in the Google Photos gorilla case, where you know, even if the data set ends up getting compiled with some kind of demographic uh, misrepresentation, and even if we're not able to catch it by using these transparency methods, maybe as kind of a last uh, line of defense, uh, we might want our model to have this kind of uncertainty built in, where it can look at a picture and notice, OK, I don't have a ton of training data that makes me particularly confident that I know how to categorize this. So I'm going to refrain. I'm not going to categorize it at all. I'm going to defer to uh, you know, a human or whatever it might be. And this has been the focus of a lot of recent work. Um, Tom Dietrich at University of Oregon has done a lot of research on what he calls the open category problem. So many uh, computer vision systems kind of implicitly have this ontology that's handed to them that says, these are all of the categories of thing that exist. And every image that you see, you know, tell me which of these categories it belongs to. And there's something kind of uh, ontologically or philosophically unsatisfying about that because it implies that nothing can be in more than one category at a time. If you see a picture of a Dalmatian and a bowl of cherries, um, you know, implicitly that has to either be a Dalmatian or a bowl of cherries. It can't be both of those things. It also implies that this ontology is exhaustive um, when in fact, the vast majority of images that you could present the system with aren't anything at all. They could just be random shapes, random noise. Um, so how do we solve this, uh, what Dietrich calls open category problem? Um, ideally, we would want models to be able to know uh, my ontology is not exhaustive. Here's something that doesn't look like any of the categories that I've seen. So, um, and that work I think is, is very, very useful in this context. Um, there's also the work of people like Yaron Gall at Oxford and Zubin Garmani, um, who have uh, done some really interesting work using a technique called dropout, for example, to enable models to uh, generate these um, stochastic predictions such that the prediction can change over time. And you can use that change as a way to measure the system's uncertainty. So if it keeps flip-flopping between two categories, um, then that's a very, very important signal that the model isn't quite sure what it's seeing. Um, and there's also work by people, I'm thinking of DeepMind's Victoria Krakowna, in trying to develop formal specifications for the level of impact that a system's action is going to take. Um, and I think this notion of formalizing uncertainty and formalizing impact really go hand in hand, that you would want to be more certain the greater the impact action that you're about to take. Um, and so there's, I think, a lot of really encouraging computer science work here. It also intersects, I think, in very rich ways with um, a lot of the literature that we have on, uh, on the human side. For example, in medical ethics, where there's this principle of not taking an irrevocable act in the face of uncertainty. Um, it also uh, connects with legal theory, where we have these ideas of um, irreparable harms and preliminary injunctions, right? So again, we're connecting uh, uncertainty to impact and saying, you know, even before we determine what's going on, we're still going to stop. Um, and you also have in academic philosophy, this idea of moral uncertainty. And there are uh, contemporary philosophers like Will McCaskill, Toby Ord, Christopher Bickvist, who are trying to articulate and, and work through this question of um, how should someone behave when they don't even know what ethical theory is appropriate to bring to a situation. You know, should you follow virtue ethics, deontological ethics, uh, utilitarian ethics? What do you do at a, at a practical level if you don't know the answer to that question, but you still have to take an action? Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's very fascinating to see some of these ideas around uncertainty, around, um, you know, pre preventative harms, uh, uh, prevention of harm, uh, and, 
this question of moral uncertainty now becoming increasingly relevant to uh, computer systems. Okay, so shifting the focus then from the training data to the other side of the equation, which is the objective function. So how do you mathematically specify the task that you want the system to carry out? Well, this is every bit as nuanced and every bit as complicated. Um, so one of the people who I think has done a lot to draw attention to this is Julia Angwin, the uh, reporter from ProPublica, who as many people I think in the audience will be familiar, uh, wrote, um, you know, led this investigation into criminal uh, risk assessment software that's used widely across the US. In particular, this model, it's called Compass, um, which generates risk scores on a scale of one to 10 for three different predictions. One is uh, likelihood to commit a violent offense, likelihood to commit a nonviolent offense, and likelihood to fail to appear for their court appointment. Um, and these risk assessment scores are used to determine things like pretrial detention. So if you're arrested and your court appointment or your court date is set for you know, a month or two months out, um, are you released pending your trial or are you detained pending your trial? Um, increasingly, those decisions are made, um, in some cases mandated by law, to be made uh, using one of these risk scores. So there's a question of whether these models for predicting these risks um, adhere to our notions of fairness that exist in civil rights law, for example. And her investigation seemed to suggest that um, the, the types of errors that the model made for black defendants were very different than the types of errors that it made for white defendants. And this really launched um, an incredible amount of activity in the theoretical computer science community to try to articulate um, how these moral and legal intuitions of fairness actually operationalize in the world of machine learning and computer science. Uh, someone who I think has been um, a real uh, pioneer in this area is Moritz Hart from UC Berkeley, um, who has contrasted uh, definitions like what's called group calibration. So group calibration says, you know, if you're uh, given a score of eight out of 10, then someone with an eight out of 10 risk should um, you know, be rearrested at the same rate as some anyone else with an eight out of 10 risk, regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, et cetera. Um, and that seems pretty intuitive. And that is in fact, the definition that has been kind of the gold standard used by criminologists for many decades. Um, but increasingly we are contrasting that against other, uh, ways to articulate and, and, uh, define fairness. For example, uh, things like equalized odds, which says, you know, are the, are the rates of false positives, um, false negatives, true positives, true negatives equal between these two groups? Are there differences in the kinds of mistakes that a model makes when it does make a mistake? Um, and it was on this metric that the Compass system uh, showed a discrepancy between uh, racial groups. Well, there's this question, having articulated these different notions of fairness, and there are many others beyond these two, but... Um, can we, can we have it all? Um, is there a way to simply um, constrain a system such that it meets multiple of these criteria at once? And this has been the subject of a, a lot of um, focus among the theoretical computer science community, including people like John Kleinberg at Cornell, Alex Choldachova at Carnegie Mellon, Sam Corbett Davies at Stanford and their collaborators. Um, and the answer is no. Um, that to, you know, to make a long story short, no, you cannot satisfy these multiple criteria at the same time, equally desirable and intuitive as they may be. And so there's a very difficult um, policy conversation that I think has to begin there, which is that, you know, the, the computer science community has articulated the limits of what we can actually expect. And now we have to have a policy conversation about what trade-offs are appropriate between those different criteria, which criteria take precedence over others, Etc. Um, but I think it's important here to zoom out and look at the bigger picture as well, um, which is to say, you know, is the is the model even predicting what we think it's predicting in the first place, and are its predictions being used in accordance with what they're designed? I think there are very big questions here, not just in the criminal justice arena, um, but more broadly as well. So, to think about it in this in this criminal context. Um, the model is designed to predict uh, crime, 
That is to say, reoffense, recidivism. But um, I think this is a very critical and sort of often uh, underemphasized point. We can't measure crime. We, all, we don't know if someone commits a crime. We only know if they were rearrested and if they were reconvicted. Um, and so there's a potentially very significant gap between those two things. Um, it was very interesting to me as I was doing the archival research because um, criminal risk assessment uh, models have a nearly 100 year history at this point. And I was looking at, they were first brought into use in Illinois uh, in the 1930s. And they were quite controversial even then. What I found quite surprising and interesting was that a lot of the critique in the 30s was coming from the conservatives. So this is uh, the uh, Republican lawmaker, Elmer Schnackenberg writing in the Chicago Tribune. Um, now, wait a minute, because a parolee isn't caught at crime during the first or second years of his parole, he's listed during those years as having made good. So he's saying, you know, someone goes out, they commit a crime. Just because they're not caught, that doesn't mean that, you know, they didn't uh, recidivate. And, you know, so we should be careful because the model is then going to recommend releasing other people you know, that have, bear some resemblance to that person. Um, nowadays, of course, as many of us know, the, the majority of the critique that's being leveled against these risk assessment models is coming from the progressive community where people on the left are saying, now, wait a minute, just because someone is wrongfully arrested and wrongfully convicted, they're getting tagged into the data as someone who did reoffend, And not only are they being wrongfully detained, but the model will recommend wrongfully detaining more people like that. Um, and so for me, it's fascinating to see that the, the kind of political valence of this critique has shifted, um, but there is a you know, 80, 90 year history of people uh, drawing attention to this gap between what we can actually measure versus what we uh, think we're predicting or what we're uh, kind of purporting to predict. And I think that's a very, very critical point. Um, there's another thing uh, here, you know, if you think about from the image classification perspective, um, there's a very significant gap between the truth of what an image contains versus the consensus of what people say that an image contains. Um, the way that these data sets are assembled for image recognition is typically that um, researchers will go into Amazon Mechanical Turk and ask a bunch of random people on the internet, you know, click the thing that has a fire hydrant or, you know, tell me what's in this picture or whatever it is. And that's the closest thing to ground truth that we have. So if the majority of people are wrong, for example, they think a baby tiger is a kitten, um, there's no possible way that the model would have of knowing that the consensus is wrong. So I think this is a very salient point. Um, Andre Carpathy, again from Tesla, when he was in graduate school, made himself kind of the human guinea pig, um, the, the human benchmark for the ImageNet competition. And after two weeks of training, and um, I have to imagine it was pretty tedious, he was able to achieve a 95% accuracy uh, in the ImageNet uh, task. So he was manually, you know, categorizing all of these different images. And I think it's philosophically very interesting to think about, well, 95% accurate with respect to what? Again, not the truth, but the consensus. And now this is something that has been picked up by people, for example, Microsoft's Kate Crawford, um, who are appealing to the fact that many of the categories in ImageNet are not even kind of objectively definable things. So for example, the ImageNet uh, database has categories like failure, loser, non-starter, unsuccessful person. And this data set was collected by going on Amazon Mechanical Turk and asking random you know, people on the internet to you know, select which of these pictures looks like a loser. But as Crawford and her collaborators point out, you know, what we don't actually know anything about these people, right? They could be have perfectly uh, self-actualized lives, you know. So what what are we teaching the model other than just human stereotypes? Um, and so that has brought, I think, an increasing scrutiny to uh, again the methodology with which these data sets are collected and the question of what really is the ground truth and is the ground truth in fact the ground truth? Um, in the criminal setting, there's, I think, a very important question about how these models predictions are used in practice. So Compass, for example, is explicitly uh, designed to be used for 
pretrial detention. It is not designed to be used in sentencing. And it, in fact, says explicitly that, that these quote unquote risk scores um, are meant to calculate specific things about the risk of offenses if you release the person pending trial, blah, blah, blah. Um, that is not to be used as evidence for giving someone a long sentence because the model says they are a quote unquote risk to society. Um, that's not what that means. And yet in practice, there are cases where the model has been used to determine sentencing. Um, so I think there's, it may be that we are kind of ready for something in machine learning akin to what we have in medicine, which is the, you know, the giant warning label on the side of the bottle that says, you know, important, all caps, bold face, use this only as directive. Um, so it may in fact be past time that we have something like that uh, for machine learning. Lastly, I think there's this question of what intervention, what real world action is this prediction designed to support? And this can sometimes be surprisingly complicated. For example, the um, city of Chicago police department had built a model that could predict accurately um, that a group of a thousand people were at something like a 100 X elevated risk of being victims of homicide. Um, and the model was accurate, but it's nonetheless very unclear how you would actually use a model like this to do any good in the world because um, it's so rare that someone will be a victim of homicide that even to be at a, a hundred risk relative to the general population, um, it's still very few of the people were victimized. And moreover, what, what do you do with that information? Do you send an officer to each person's door and just tell them to like, be careful? Um, what do you do? And so this was an example where there was this model that was making valid predictions, but the connection to action was totally unclear. What do you actually do? Um, in the case of risk assessment, I think there's a very important question of what do we do with this prediction that says, in this case, um, someone is likely to fail to appear for their trial. Uh, well, one thing that we can do is incarcerate that person, and that's one way of ensuring that they will appear for their trial. Um, another thing we could do is release them and then send them a text message the morning of or the night before saying, hey, your trial is, is this day. Um, there's a growing body of evidence that says that that actually has a huge uh, effect in their likelihood of showing up. And so again, the model itself is kind of agnostic on how its predictions are getting used, but that may in fact be one of the most significant parts of the whole puzzle. Um, now, thus far, I've been talking primarily about what people with machine learning background would know as supervised learning. Um, I wanna shift the focus at the end of the talk here to an area called reinforcement learning. And uh, people will know this as the technology behind the incredible successes we've seen in video game playing, um, Go, right? Defeating the world champion at Go. Um, it's behind a lot of the advances in robotics and uh, you know, physical manipulation, self-driving cars, et cetera. So for people who aren't familiar, reinforcement learning, rather than uh, being about making these categorizations or these judgments kind of one at a time, is about taking sequences of actions. Um, and in particular, it is about taking sequences of actions that lead to some um, numerical sense of a reward. Um, so it might be winning a game of Go, or it might be getting a lot of points in an Atari game, um, whatever it might be um, that the program or the model finds itself in an environment and it learns to take these strings of actions that will ultimately lead to points in whatever form. And I think some of these domains are reasonably familiar to us, but I think it's less appreciated that reinforcement learning is increasingly being deployed into social media services. Um, so this is a white paper from Facebook in 2018 talking about how they have moved from supervised learning to reinforcement learning in delivering a lot of their notifications. So once you do that, you start to incorporate these temporal effects where maybe you send someone a notification uh, not only do you try to optimize the chance that they'll click on it, um, but you also have to make sure that you don't send them so many notifications that they shut off notifications altogether or leave your platform. Um, and so Facebook and other companies have been moving to um, this reinforcement learning model to take these temporal changes into account. I think it's somewhat ironic that the model that they use is called DQN, which is Deep Q Networks, which is the exact same model architecture that DeepMind used for its Atari uh, paper. So there's a sense in which um, 
you know, the, the Facebook uh, notification system is, uh, is literally playing us the way that, you know, our AIs uh, have previously played Atari games. So we, we are the Atari game uh, administering this, the score that uh, Facebook is seeking to maximize here. So there's an important alignment question in reinforcement learning, which is who designs the score function? You know, how do we define the quote unquote points that we're trying to maximize? There are many famous examples from the research world of this going kind of surprisingly quickly off the rails. So this is from a team at OpenAI where they were trying to win, tra train an agent through reinforcement learning to win this boat race. Um, but it's very difficult to capture concepts like track position or what lap you're on, or are you ahead or behind of other agents, blah, blah, blah. So instead they just did the simple thing, which was they taught it to maximize the in-game score. Unfortunately, uh, the in-game score was fundamentally kind of decorrelated with actually winning the race. And so what their agent learned to do was just spin around and do circles forever in this little harbor where it could keep collecting these power-ups. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the rest of the race just moves on and it's just stuck doing circles forever. So those are the sorts of cautionary tales um, that keep AI safety researchers up at night thinking about real world systems that might get um, uh, you know, derailed in a similar way by a, uh, a poorly chosen set of incentives. This is something, um, you know, every researcher has their own stash of stories of how this can go wrong. Uh, one of my favorites comes from a group of Danish researchers in the 90s that were uh, developing a reinforcement learning system to um, ride a virtual bicycle to a destination. And they gave it points for any time it made progress toward the destination. Well, the system found a loophole. And the loophole was that it, they'd forgotten to subtract points for progress away from the destination. And so the easiest thing for the system to do was just to ride the bike in circles. And 50% of the time it was racking up those points. And that was much easier to learn to do that than to actually go anywhere. Um, a similar story happened to David Andre and Astro Teller. They were developing a robotic system to play soccer. They decided to give it some uh, points as, a, as an incentive. They would give it kind of a fraction, of, you know, maybe a hundredth of a goal. Uh, as an incentive to take possession of the ball, because that's kind of a, a way to induce the system to learn that taking possession is a, usually a necessary precursor to scoring points. But again, the system found a loophole. Instead of learning to actually play soccer, it just learned to approach the ball and get close enough where it could repeatedly vibrate its paddle, just accumulating these uh, you know, tenths and hundredths of a point uh, for repeatedly taking possession of it over and over and over again. So. This has really led to a question of how do we design uh, reward functions or scoring functions for reinforcement learning systems that don't create these kind of horrible sorcerer's apprentice type situations? Um, there's been a lot of work, um, but I think one of the most promising directions is to say uh, we simply shouldn't design reward functions by hand at all. In fact, we should allow the system to learn the reward function itself by observing us. Now, this may seem a little bit strange at first, but um, humans, for example, have an incredibly well-developed ability to infer the rewards or the, the, uh, what is motivating someone else. So this is uh, Felix Varnikin, um, who has shown that you know, if you bang into a cabinet door with a stack of magazines and you can't open the door, children as young as 18 months will uh, walk over and open the cabinet for you. Um, so, and I think this is amazing because this is years before uh, children have developed theory of mind. So they don't know what, you're, what you can perceive, they don't know what you believe, but they know what you want based on your actions. And so there's been a lot of really interesting work in computer science um, on figuring out if systems can internalize what we want just based on the way that we behave. And so there's been a lot of work at Stanford, at Berkeley, people like Stuart Russell, Andrew Ng, Peter Abiel, um, showing, for example, in a driving simulation, um, it may take the system a long time to learn how to drive, uh, but it can very quickly identify that humans like to keep to the right except when passing and go the and avoid uh, collisions with other cars. So our behavior may be complicated and messy, but our goals, at least in this case, are quite transparent and very easy for the computer itself to learn. 
this has been very encouraging and there's been a number of uh, kind of signature success stories in this area. For example, um, uh, an autonomous helicopter where you can attempt stunts using a remote controller. And even if you can't successfully execute the stunt, um, the system can figure out what it is you were trying to do and then perform that stunt better than you yourself ever could. Um, people like Chelsea Finn are extending this into increasingly complicated real world settings. For example, uh, filling dishes in a dish rack and the robot can infer what you're trying to do and then finish the task for you. Um, and there's work on cases where you don't even have the ability to demonstrate the thing that you want. All you have is the ability to recognize it when you see it. And so this was a team between OpenAI and DeepMind um, where they would simply show you two different videos of a particular action. In this case, um, people were instructed to try to get a robot to learn how to backflip. And the only thing you could do is just watch two different videos, one of which would hopefully look slightly more like a backflip than the other. And that's all you would do. You would just say, this looks a little bit more like a backflip. That looks a little bit more like a backflip. Behind the scenes, um, the agent would be trying to infer what it is that it, th it thinks you think a backflip is, um, and then attempting to execute that. And to me, this is incredible because there was no, it was not obvious at all that this was going to work, but it did work. So after just 900 comparisons, which takes about an hour, but 900 bits of feedback is not very much, um, this uh, agent is executing these kind of beautiful, you know, gymnastically perfect backflips. It's tucking the knee in order to spin faster the way, you know, a figure skater would, and it's sticking the landing. And to me, this is incredibly encouraging. Um, you know, I think this is just the beginning, but there really is a hope for me that I, that I feel um, that we are able to develop systems moving forward that can uh, internalize some notion of what it is that humans want, even in the cases where we can't articulate it directly, uh, we can't operationalize it into a reward function uh, directly, um, even in cases where we can't demonstrate it there still might be a way to get that sense of what it is that we want the system to do into the system. Um, so in conclusion, I think we really are at the beginning of an incredibly exciting chapter in this, in, in this story of our relationship with AI. Um, I think there's every reason to be concerned and to, to take this problem incredibly seriously. Um, but there's also, to me, a real feeling that we are kind of rising to meet the moment, that there's an incredibly uh, brilliant and diverse group of people mustering around the, these set of problems. And the field is growing at an amazing rate. Uh, we are making some very tangible progress in an amazingly short period of time. Um, and I think done right, um, it's not only a way to ensure that we avoid some of the worst disasters, but it's also, I think, a, a profound uh, encounter uh, and a sort of a revelatory encounter with what just what it is exactly that we want and that we hope for um, in our society. To me, the person who um, really articulates the moment that we find ourselves in is Alan Turing. Um, this is from a, a BBC radio uh, panel that he was part of in 1952, where he said, you know, I was, I've been doing all these experiments, teaching a machine, uh, various things, and it's always learning incorrectly, you know, it's learning the wrong thing, I have to intervene, or it's learning too slowly, I have to intervene, or, you know, going in the wrong direction, I have to stop it. Um, and, you know, I suspect a, a very great uh, amount of such intervention will be necessary. And his co-panelist interrupts him and says, well, but who was learning, Turing? You or the machine? And Turing responds, well, I suppose we both were. With that, I wanna thank you and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Brian. And right at the conclusion, I was kicked off the internet, but I'm back on. So let's dig right into these questions because we only have about nine minutes left and hopefully my internet connection stays. But if I drop off uh, the director of Citrus, Camille Crittenden will step in to help um, pose the questions. 
So the, the top rated question is, to what degree is the alignment problem a result from computer scientists poor background in empirical research with societal phenomena and its challenges and problems? Any implications uh, for teaching and practice? Um, that's a very good question. So um, there are a lot of counterintuitive things that come up when theory meets practice. Um, that's certainly the case in computer science as it is in many places. Um, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is that there's, there's kind of this implicit ideal that a model being more transparent is a good thing. I think most of us have that intuition. Um, but it turns out once you do real user studies, it's actually more complicated. So there's a group at Microsoft Research um, led by Faru Prasabzi Sangde and Jen Wortman Vaughn that did a bunch of really interesting studies showing people actual models, in this case for predicting um, home valuation and giving different groups of people models that were either more transparent or less transparent. And one of the things you see is that the people given the more transparent model trust the model more, which sounds good, but they trust it more even when it's way out of its training distribution and outputting garbage. Um, so that's just one example. But to your question, I think there really is um, no substitute for actual real world studies. And I think that's why we need an increasingly tight coupling between the computer science community and social sciences. There's a nice segue from your point there about the need for this real world testing to the next question I want to pose. Uh, it says most biases surface up when the models are put to test or deployed in real life. Say when any adverse event occurs, any thoughts on how do we learn about these biases during the model development stage? Yeah. Um, ideally, we want to not have to learn everything by trial and error, right? Um, and so I think that's one place where transparency methods can come in. Um, so, you know, for example, I give that example with uh, the fire truck. So that's a case where we can hopefully nip something in the bud. Um, there have been some other real world cases where um, a group of dermatologists were um, developing a model to diagnose skin lesions. And it was uh, comparable diagnostic accuracy to the dermatologists themselves. Sounds great. Let's deploy it. Well, hold on. And they used um, saliency maps, which is kind of a technique to determine which parts of an image are being used by the model. Um, and the saliency map showed that the thing that the model was really looking for when it was looking at someone's skin was the presence or absence of a ruler in the picture. Um, because it turns out that a lot of medical textbook images have a ruler for scale. And so the model learned, oh, when there's a ruler there, it's probably cancer. Um, which happens to be true, but that's completely useless in a diagnostic setting. Um, so I do think transparency methods have an important role to play. Um, and I also think, as I said, these uncertainty techniques that um, ideally if a system finds itself operating out of, out of its comfort zone, so to speak, it should know that and be able to kind of defer. And so there's been a lot of work on essentially supervised learning with the ability to kind of throw your hands up and say, I'm deferring to the humans because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so work like that, I think, is, is another big part of the puzzle. But I think it's going to take a couple different things. And another factor that you brought up in your presentation was on the need for diverse teams to evaluate these tools. And we know that people of color, especially women of color, are underrepresented in the field of AI and especially in industry. Um, so I wonder if you could provide any remarks on suggestions you might have on how we can better ensure that diverse perspectives are included in not only developing these tools, but evaluating their effects. I think that's a great point. Um, just as we need to think about um, what, you know, the composition of the data set, I think we also need to be thinking about the composition of the actual people that make these tools. Um, and so we are seeing people, um, you know, I'm thinking Tim Neat Gebru has been one of many people who's kind of brought this to light and has kind of increased focus on this area. So I think partly just asking the question and expecting a certain level of accountability from companies, I think that's part of it. I think um, initiatives like Black and AI, um, uh, which has done some amazing work using scholarships and things like this to increase attendance at uh, industry um, events. Um, that is, that is a very important part of it. Um, I think it's gonna take a lot of different things, but 
from my perspective, we're starting to see at least the beginning of that. I mean, I, you know, I can't come soon enough, but I think, I think it's going in the right direction. And I think it's increasingly being realized that this is a big part of it. Thank you. I'm going to turn to some of the questions posed here in the Q and A box. Um, the next question uh, is targeted on the computational linguistics and NLP communities. And they say, you know, addressing the fairness issue uh, has made great progress by exposing biases and frequently used data sets for the full range of NLP tasks and applications, as well as those entrenched in academia. Um, it, we talk about, you know, the predominance of majority white men who end up in the, being the decision makers for these tools. Um, do you connect with any people in these communities to help support their work? Yeah, so we haven't talked very much about language models. I mean, that's something that comes up throughout the book, but just in the interest of time, I, we focused on criminal justice and vision and RL. But um, yeah, if you think about things like word to vec, um, these uh, vector word embeddings that have these, um, you know, sexist analogies of, you know, man is to computer programmer, what woman is to homemaker and these uh, things like that. And models like that end up getting used in hiring situations, which can be very, um, very catastrophic. It's been interesting. So in terms of those communities, there's been a lot of interesting work happening. Um, Tolga Balukbasi, who was at BU and is now at Google, has done a lot of work on sort of de-biasing some of these models after the fact. Um, I've been in contact with him. I interviewed him for the book and I, his work, I think, is really, um, really valuable. Um, we're now moving into the world of these giant you know, gigantic uh, transformer models like GPT-2, GPT-3, 175 billion parameter models. And we don't really have the same kinds of transparency tools yet uh, that we have for the previous generation of tools, the sort of vector embedding models. So it's a case where I think in NLP, we're playing catch up a little bit. Um, and so the technology is at this point, I think ahead of where we're at with our actual sort of alignment research. That being said, there are people at um, OpenAI, I'm thinking of Daniel Ziegler, people at DeepMind like Jeffrey Irving. Um, so finding ways to essentially fine tune these giant generic unsupervised language models to output a kind of language that we want or to avoid certain types of language that we don't want. Um, that's a very much an active area. I'm going to ask one final question in the last minute we have here. Um, and I think it's a pretty foundational question that you know one of the purported benefits or claims is that algorithms can be unbiased, right? We're trying to develop methodologies to make them unbiased. Um, but they ask if we use techniques where machine learning algorithms learn what the human teachers want, we again give a huge amount of control to a very small group of humans. So does this actually solve anything? It's interesting, I, you know, this may seem like a digression, but actually for me, um, I keep coming back to the etymology of the word alignment. So um, before alignment was used by the computer science community, starting with Stuart Russell circa 2014, um, it was primarily used by economists and people in management science, um, thinking about how do you align the values within an organization? How do you align the interests of parties in a contract? Or how do you align the incentives of your staff or your management or whatever? Um, I think this is a, it, bearing this etymological context in mind is very useful because it reminds us that the alignment problem was always a human problem first. Um, and if we can solve the technical AI safety part, um, I think that will be a huge achievement. And I don't, I'm, it's not certain that we can or will, but um, if we can do that, it's still one link in the chain, right? If we can align a machine learning system with the people who made it, well, we still have to align the interest of those people with everyone who's going to ultimately be affected. And that gets us back to the question of representation and who has a seat at the table. Um, and so I think that that is the fundamental issue that we're gonna be left with, even after we can declare victory on the technical part of the problem. Exactly. And thank you for that, Brian. And you address many of these issues in your book, The Alignment Problem. So I encourage everybody to check out Brian's book. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. This video recording will be made available um, soon. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you.